Today is Thursday, October 3rd, 2013. My name is Clint Reisner. I'm also the videographer, and the interview's name is Herb Bennett. And the place of the interview is at the Dallas Jewish Community Center. We're very happy to have you here, Herb, and we shall start. And if you would like to begin elaborating or telling us about your family, your parents, grandparents, where and where were you born, and how did they happen to settle in Dallas, and what did your parents do for a living? Well, uh, my parents are originally from Russia. They came to New York in about uh, in the early 1900s. They met briefly in Europe, but they were married in New York, and my brother and sister were born in New York. However, my mother couldn't tolerate the winters in New York, and so after getting many letters from her brother who had settled in Texas, in Fort Worth, she convinced my father that they could make a, a life and a living in a warmer climate, and they moved to Fort Worth, Texas in 1919, 1920, and I was born in 1923 in Fort Worth. Uh, I don't know anything about my grandparents. They stayed in Europe and were killed in 1939 in Poland when Hitler began his first push into Poland and trying to conquer Europe. Uh, my childhood was spent the first 17 years were spent in Breckenridge, Texas. After, after being born in Fort Worth, my father found work in the little town of Breckenridge and about 100 miles west of Fort Worth. And uh, that was in 1923 when I was being born. And after I was six weeks old, my mother followed and I followed him to Breckenridge. I grew up in the little town of Breckenridge, and in 1929, they built the first synagogue that existed between Fort Worth and Abilene, and maybe Fort Worth and El Paso. The synagogue was uh, a gathering place for all the little communities surrounding Breckenridge. There was always one or two families living and working in the little tiny little towns all around Breckenridge. And Breckenridge was a sort of a hub, a gathering place for all the Jewish community because there were only about 10 or 12 families in my hometown when I grew up. This was in Breckenridge? Breckenridge. Okay. What was your neighborhood like there? My neighborhood? Uh -huh, in Breckenridge. Did you live in a sort of a Jewish neighborhood? No, or? there was no Jewish okay. neighborhood. There okay. was just they were just scattered, scattered okay. Jews. I mean, uh, very few families. They were mostly merchants or junk dealers oh. or pipe dealers. Uh, uh, it was, uh, even though we had a synagogue, we, we didn't have a rabbi. One of the members of the community would conduct services uh, on Friday nights. And for the high holidays, they would usually import a rabbi from Wichita Falls, mm -hmm. Fort Worth, Abilene, anywhere, just for the high holidays. We got a variety of, of uh, rabbis. One rabbi even came with a Gentile wife. That's <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> and it was, uh, 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 it was not really a, uh, I didn't, we didn't have a, uh, a Hebrew school some of the families would send their children to Fort Worth to the Hebrew school, but, but uh, well, sometimes uh, an older girl would teach Sunday school to the local kids, and then when she grew up and disappeared, we were left without a teacher. So it wasn't, wasn't really a, 
an organized formal education as a, as a Jewish student. Uh, my Jewish upbringing was very sparse, even though my father and my mother had a much stricter Jewish education than I did. Mine was very, in a little town in West Texas, they said that a Gentile from New York was probably more Jewish than a Jew from West Texas. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, what was the population of Breckenridge at this time? It was, uh, Breckenridge had about, one, when, uh, in 1919, it was about 500 people. In 1920 or 1919, they discovered oil. And in six months, it grew from 500 to close to 30,000. It was an oil boom town that was, made, they made a movie out of it called Boomtown. And it was starred Clark Gable and Hedy Lamar and Spencer Tracy. It was a street of muddy, uh, a town of muddy streets and wooden sidewalks. And it was right out of the movies because it grew so fast. And then it, by the time my father got there in 1923, the boom had already dissipated and he was on the tail end of the boom, although there was still oil activity and pumping oil wells and a big, a lot of employment was in the oil industry. It was, the oil boom was gone. And the town, when I moved, when I grew up there was only about six or 7,000. And that's the town I remember. Uh, and I'm going to a high school reunion this weekend. I was in the class of 1940. That's. 60, 73 years ago when I graduated. And there's a class reunion? There's a class reunion. What year would it be? It'll, be? it'll be for the whole school. Oh, whole school. Yeah. So I may be the only representative from the class of 1940. You're seated in the auditorium according to your class. Mm -hmm. And the last time I was in a class reunion was maybe six or eight years ago, and there were only two of us there. So I'm not sure that there'll be even two of us. Mm -hmm. uh, for years and years, the oldest living graduate was a Jewish man named Max Goldblatt. And he came every year until he was in his 80s. This year, I'll be, I'll be going and I'll be 90. So I should probably be close to the oldest one there. So you saw a lot of changes in Breckenridge. Oh then. gosh, did I ever. The whole city, the his city history was recorded by a hermit, a recluse named Basil Clemens, not Jewish, but mm -hmm. he he recorded all the the things that happened when when the town was in its infancy and it was growing. He grew up with the town and recorded it all on camera. He used to take the the pictures of the high school graduating class every year. And that was when his camera was one that he had a hood over his the camera and he just removed the lens, uh, cover from the lens and knew what, how long to expose it and then put the cover back on. And the flash was a powder, white powder that made a huge explosion and everybody always jumped when he made a picture. Uh, you did see an incredible, remarkable change in your hometown, town from 500 to 30,000. That's yeah, a, but it's it, remarkable. By the time I got there, it had dwindled down and it wound up being six or 7,000. So I never saw it when it was in its mm -hmm. boom time because that was before I was oh, born. I see. Okay. What did you do for amusement in such a small town? Uh, you had a movie theater, I'm sure. Yeah, we had three theaters at one time. and. Uh, uh, I got interested in the stage and I was in something called the contest play and that was a, an interscholastic league event that was uh, we got to we didn't get, go to state but we we did pretty well and our judge was a, a playwright from Albany Texas named Robert Nail who is well known in those circles as a as a, uh, a author and a playwright and uh, we did, we had a YMCA and I learned to swim there and I was very active in the Boy Scouts. Uh, it was sponsored by a church group and I 
my highest achievement was my Eagle Scout badge, which I got when I was about 15. All right. That was probably the high point of my whole life. From there, it was downhill. <laughs> um, oh, that's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. And they had lakes, and we and I was a Sea Scout, and we had a sailboat, and we used to go out on the lake and sail, and uh, uh, there were a lot of activities in a small town that probably I used to envy my brother and sister because the family album always had pictures of them playing in the snow in New York, and I, I never saw snow in Texas until I was about 12 years old, so I really envied them. But I had a, a wonderful life because I could walk out my back door and in 30 minutes I was in the woods and I used to take my trusty 22 rifle and hunt rabbits. I never killed a rabbit in my whole life. The, mo the, the most things I shot at were beer cans and bottles and uh, it was, it was a, an interesting life because I liked to hike in the woods and make believe I was a great white hunter, but really I didn't. I didn't do much hunting. I just did mostly hiking. Okay, I don't recall this, but what did your parents do in Breckenridge? They were merchants. My father came there and bought half interest in a in a confectionery next to the theater. In those years, movie theaters didn't sell candy, popcorn, drinks, nothing. You had to get them out in the little stand next to the theater, you could buy your popcorn or your drinks or candy and take it into the theater. And so after about 10 years, from 1923 to 33, my father was in this little uh, stand and the hours were terrible. They had to wait till the last movie was over at one o'clock in the morning to sell a magazine or a drink and then they had to open up at four or five o'clock in the morning to maybe sell a pair of work gloves to an oil field worker on his way to the oil fields to work. So it was a, a real hard job. And if it hadn't been for two partners, they probably couldn't have handled it because they took turns sharing the, the weird hours. And I had a paper route and, and I had for four years, I carried the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, which was published morning, evening, and Sunday. So in the morning, at four o'clock in the morning, I would get up when the papers came in and deliver my route before school. And then in the after school at 3.30, the evening paper would come to Breckenridge from Fort Worth and I would deliver the evening route. So for four years, I delivered the morning route, the evening route, and on Sunday, the papers were huge and it took two deliveries to make the route because the papers were so big. In those years, they didn't have uh, sleeves, cellophane sleeves for the papers. You had to fold them, and so it was a big job. And I graduated in 1940 and went to school at the University of Texas in Austin, which was a big first time I'd ever really been out of Breckenridge uh, for any length of time. And I fell in love with Austin, and I wanted to teach there. And my brother had gone to Austin, my sister had gone to Austin to the school, and it was natural for me to go to the university. And uh, I started out following in my brother's footsteps as an engineer, but I loved Austin so much I wanted to be a teacher, so I changed after the war. I, I went from 40 to 42, and in 42 I was left school because of the war. And when I finally got back to school to finish in 46 to 48, I became a, uh, an education major thinking I would teach in Austin. But I found out that everybody wanted to teach in Austin. And the only way you could get a job as a teacher was to have a PhD or a master's degree. So I never did become a teacher. Instead, I went to Houston and uh, went to work in the construction business as a draftsman at twice the salary I would have gotten as a starting teacher. Okay. Uh, 
So you had a very active childhood in a small town. It was. It was very, very. Uh, there, there was, there was, a small community, but it was a close knit community. Everybody knew everybody else, and it was uh, a very friendly atmosphere. Uh, it was much more so than growing up in the city, where you sometimes don't even know who your neighbor is. Mm -hmm. Everybody in in the town knew everybody else, and. Uh, I enjoyed my childhood very much, and I probably don't regret not having the snow to play in in New York. Okay, you didn't experience any anti-Semiticism in a small town? In what? Anti-Semiticism. There was a little anti-Semitism, but it wasn't overt because most people in that little town had never seen a Jew before, and they probably thought the Jews had horns because of a Michelangelo painting of Moses with rays of light coming from his head and everybody misinterpreted that as horns. And from that day forward, everybody thought Jews had horns. It was a funny thing, but it was, it was not, it was never a, a problem to be Jewish in this little town. Okay, so your grade school, high school was in Breckenridge, then you went to University of Texas. University in of Texas, and, and from the University of Texas, I settled in in Houston, and in Houston, uh, I was a draftsman for a construction company, and uh, I always wanted to go overseas and work, but I never had the opportunity until one day. My boss leaned over my table and said, we have a problem. He said, we have a project in South America and we need to send somebody down there to inspect it for three weeks, but it's three weeks before Christmas. And so nobody wants to go and be away from their family at Christmas time. He says, you're single and you're Jewish you don't have those problems. Would you like to go? So I always wanted to go overseas. I said, lovely, I will go. This was to Venezuela? So for three weeks, what? Was, this was to go to Venezuela, right? Yeah. Okay, tell so us I, I, I was going to go for three weeks, and I went for three weeks and stayed seven years. <laughs> because in order to be tax exempt, you had to stay out of the country 18 months and they would always send me back to Houston for a few weeks to be briefed on my work and I would lose my accumulated eligibility and I would have to start over again when I got back to, to uh, Venezuela. And I was working in, in Maracaibo, which was a, an oil boom community, and uh, I, I didn't have a, 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 I found a company there that was located there so I wouldn't have to be sent back to Houston and I changed jobs and went to work for the oil company. And so uh, that way I was able to stay there and be tax exempt, which was a big thing for a single man. So I stayed there for, for off and on for, for seven years and then when I finally came back to, to Dallas in the six, early 60s, uh, a friend of mine I'd met in South America called me up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm relaxing. I'm, I'm home and taking care of my house and reading the Sunday paper. He said, get off the couch. We need you here. And I said, where is here? He said, Turkey. I said, is that in Texas? He said, no, it's on the Black Sea. And so being a single man, I've always regretted not having a wife and family and children, but there was a, a big advantage in that when I had an offer like that, I could drop everything and take off without worrying about wife, children, family. And so I was off to Turkey and I worked there for two years. And, uh, and when I finished working there, it was a whole new world in Turkey. Turkey was about 200 years behind the rest of the world. They were still plowing fields there with a wooden plow and an ox. It was, it was just, of course, if they hadn't been way behind the times, 
they never would have hired my company to do the work for them. So it was, it was fortunate in a way. And so after working in Turkey for a couple of years, I was being sent back home and I decided that I had never visited my relatives in Israel. I knew I had relatives there, but I had never the, had the occasion to go to Israel. So instead of going back to America, I traveled around Europe for a while and then wound up in Athens looking for a ship going to Israel. As soon as I got to Greece, I was picked up by the secret police because my passport showed I had worked in Turkey and I found out that Turkey and Greece had not been friendly for about two or three hundred years. And so they viewed me with suspicion having been working in Turkey. So they just questioned me and found out that I was nothing but a dumb American tourist and they let me go. And so I stayed there until about a week and I finally caught a ship that was going to Egypt, Syria, and then Cyprus. And Cyprus is very close to Israel. So I got on the ship, this Russian ship, a cruise ship out of the uh, Odessa. And it was an interesting experience because nobody on the ship spoke English. They were all Russian, except my cabin boy was trying to learn English. So between my cabin boy and him trying to talk to me in English and me trying to understand him, uh, I got along and I wound up in Cyprus. In Cyprus, it's a little island off the coast of Israel and uh, there was a, a week there before I finally caught a ship going to Israel and I was let off Tel Aviv in Tel Aviv which has no port. So they took a, a launch and took me to the shore in a launch. And as soon as I landed, I was picked up by the Mossad, the secret police. <laughs> it seems that my passport showed that I'd been in Egypt and Syria, and, Turkey. <laughs> and those weren't friendly countries to Israel. So they took me to a room. What year was this, sir? This was in 1964. Okay. Oh, okay. They took me to a room and interrogated me. They just wanted to know if I had seen any military installations in any of these countries. And I said, no, I wasn't looking for anything like that. I was a tourist. And so they let me go and they took me uh, to a cafe and bought me a coffee. And I proceeded to look up my relatives who lived in Haifa. And I wound up working on a kibbutz, Palmachim, teaching English. When they found out I had a degree in English, they, they let me become a teacher of English where they teach, I taught grades one through eight. They teach English to children as soon as they go to school. And so it was an interesting experience. They tried to teach me Hebrew while I tried to teach them English. And then I met a girl there who was from Canada. She had made Aliyah and she had settled in Israel. And she introduced me to a lot of people. And I, uh, one of them, I was my a friend from my hometown who was working on the Tel Aviv Hilton Hotel. And since I was a draftsman, he hired me to make sketches for the air conditioning the work that he was doing. And so on the weekends, I worked as a draftsman at the Hilton Hotel. And during the week, I was a teacher on the kibbutz. And I did that for two years until I came back to the States in 65. <clears throat> uh, during these years um, in your, of your adult activities, Herb, were you active, you were active in the Boy Scouts, you became an Eagle Scout. Uh, what about any Jewish organizations? Were you ever, you didn't have the opportunity in Britain? No, much. there wasn't too much Jewish activity in our little town. Uh, when I got to the University of Texas, I joined a, uh, a Jewish fraternity, AEPI, 
and I was participating in, in the Hillel and uh, okay. all the activities that the school offered at that time. But in my hometown, there wasn't very much other than the synagogue uh, on Friday night, which wasn't always uh, geared toward young people. It was mm -hmm. a, a, always a service was in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And we never, at first, when they first opened the synagogue, the women sat on one side and the men on the other. And little by little, they assimilated the group and it became a more of a reform synagogue than it was a conservative synagogue. Mm -hmm. Well, then I assume that living seven years in Venezuela, you became quite fluent in Spanish, right? <laughs> Not really. They taught us, they sent us to a school. They, they conducted a Spanish class. However, the Spanish that we learned was mostly for working people and slang, and it wasn't really a good Spanish. And so I, I, uh, I got a smattering of Spanish, but it wasn't really a formal mm -hmm. learning like I should have gotten. But I still know a lot of the words and I can understand some of the, the language, but I just mm -hmm. don't, I'm not able to speak Spanish. Okay, you lived seven years in Venezuela. How many years did you live in Israel? Two years. Two years. Yeah, and that was, that was a, 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 a more interesting experience because Israel was a complete change from anything I was ever used to. And my cousin was only 12 years old. And he and I used to hitchhike from one end of Israel to the other. And one time we got a ride with a truck driver and his stop was at the King Solomon's Mines, the Timna Mines, which is no longer, it's now a tourist attraction. But we, we hitchhiked from Don in the north to Elat in the south. And we went to all kinds of functions and activities in the Negev and in, in, in uh, Beersheba and in Jerusalem and, and uh, Tel Aviv and Haifa. It was a, a, it's the only way to see a country is to live there and work there. If you go there, it's just for a few weeks, you don't really know the country. And so I, I made friends with my family for the first time, and now there's only one member of the family left, and he just got through with a visit of 10 days here in my country, and he comes every year or two to visit me from Israel. This time he brought his wife, and she is from Paris, so they spent five days in Paris on the way here, and, uh, and she now lives in Israel, and... Uh, and she is a, an accomplished, she had her own restaurant and she became an accountant to help him. He's a CPA. And so uh, I used to, when I visited Israel, he would take me on his rounds. He would have accounts at various kibbutzim all over the country and uh, he would take me with him on his work. Okay. Uh, well, you're a very international person. Well, and uh, what was the major reason why you came to Dallas after being all of these in all of these uh, interesting places? Well, the truth of the matter is, my family. When my father died, I was in working in South America in '58, and I came to the funeral, and then went back to work. And when I came back, the family had, when my father passed away, the family had moved from Breckenridge to Dallas, where my sister lived. And so when I finished working overseas in the 60s, I had no hometown more. The Breckenridge was gone and uh, the family was all in Dallas. And so naturally I came to live in Dallas and joined them. And uh, I never thought I would find work in my field because most of the construction in the oil industry is in Houston. But I found a company, Peerless Manufacturing, and they had work all over the world, and I went to work for them, and I worked for them for almost 25 years. And they, uh, they sent me all over the place, and, and it was a, a very interesting experience. And I enjoyed working in different countries, 
because they were a big company and they took care of all your expenses and I was able to live on their living allowance and deposit my salary without touching my salary. It was deposited for me in the States. So you've been in Dallas several years now. Yeah, I came back to Dallas in the early 60s. I guess in 65, I came back to Dallas and I've been in Dallas ever since. Okay. Uh, were you ever married? Or? Yes, I was married uh, for 10 years from 19, 75 to 1985. I married a woman that I thought was an unusual person. She was working on her PhD and uh, we had a lot in common. Unfortunately, she wasn't Jewish. And my parents were not very happy with the idea, but they thought at age 52, if I didn't get married, I probably never would get married. So they they gave me their blessing, and I was married uh, for 10 years, from 75 to 85. And, uh, and then it was, she was quite a bit younger, and I guess that contributed to our separation. She was 32, and I was 52 when we got married. And so the marriage, when it's difference when we went our separate ways after about 10 years and I uh, I've been a bachelor ever since okay. uh, Dallas connections when you came to Dallas what year was that you told me earlier in 1965 okay you've seen a lot of changes here in Dallas haven't oh you? yeah yeah Dallas is how has the city changed well 65 you came here in 65 oh, tremendous so that's changes. 35 48 years i've been in dallas and uh uh dallas has has grown it's 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 uh become a cosmopolitan city although i have uh worked overseas since i've been here but i pretty much this has been my home base all the time i've been here and it has a large Jewish community, so I was able to participate in the B'nai B'rith and, uh, and many other Jewish activities that I didn't have the opportunity to do in my hometown. Uh, yes, I came to Dallas in 1970 from South America. And like you, yeah, I have seen incredible changes here. You were in Colombia, next, right next door to where I right, was working. Right, right, and I was in Peru. I was there for a total of 10 years almost. And you know, in, when I was working in, in South America, people would go to Colombia to buy things cheap. You could buy an arrow shirt for $2. Hmm. Back in the days when Venezuela was a boom town country and everything was expensive but in Colombia it was poverty mm -hmm. it was there was no oil boom in Colombia and so you you could get everything was cheaper so every holiday everybody would go to Cucuta Cucuta or, on the border yes yeah, I know. On the, very close Cucuta, to the border Colombia, yeah. and uh, it was a, a place to buy things cheap of course when you came across the border, there was inspectors. So the way to avoid inspectors was either to put on three or four pairs of pants and two or three shirts, or to take your underwear and soil it so that when they picked up the clothes to smell it, to see if it was new, they would get the odor of, <laughs> and they would put it down immediately. <laughs> but otherwise you had to pay a stiff, tax or stiff duty on, on new clothes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you, I'm sure you've been very much a part of seeing the changes in the Dallas Jewish community here oh, yeah. over that period of time. Mm -hmm. How has it changed the Jewish community since you came here? Well, it's, it's, been, it's, it's grown a lot since I was here. and. Although I've never been very active 
in the Dallas Jewish community. I still participate in the things that are of interest to me, and, and uh, I'm particularly addicted to theater. And the Jewish Community Center has been a, done a musical play every year for maybe 15 to 20 years, and I've been in every one of them. They did South Pacific, Guys and Dolls. They did all the most wonderful shows on Broadway, and we had a wonderful uh, director who would always come and do the show. And I love being in, in, the, in, the, in the Dallas musicals at the, at the Jewish Community Center. Uh, other than that, my main hub of activity has been uh, at the social club that, are, that is connected with the Jewish Community Center and uh, going on trips and, and uh, uh, participating in all the activities that uh, I found interesting. It was uh, things that I couldn't get in a small town mm -hmm. were here in Dallas. Okay, Herb, uh, I'm going to ask you some concluding questions, and of course you can add more to this. You've had a vast uh, experiences living in different countries, in Turkey, and, I mean, really a diversity of cultures and languages. Uh, One of the interesting things about South America is that the two synagogues were side by side, only a half a block apart. One was an Ashkenazi, and one was a Sephardim. In where? In Maracaibo. Maracaibo. And I used to go to the one with a Sephardim, although my parents were from Russia and Poland, mm -hmm. and I would be naturally be an Ashkenazi. I still preferred to go to the Sephardim community because the rabbi there was so elegant. He wore a silk top hat. He wore robes. His wife waited on him hand and foot. He took me home to dinner one time, and his wife met him at the door, took off his little robe, and gave him another little robe, and he, she waited on him hand and foot. She was like a servant, which is traditional, Suffer. the old European way. Right. It is the way they, they did that. The women always walked behind. Mm -hmm. And that's the way, although I didn't approve of that, it was the way he, he operated, and he was so elegant. Mm -hmm. And then I later found out the reason he invited me home was because he had a young, eligible daughter, and he thought that all anybody from America was rich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't know I was just a poor draftsman. <laughs> and so he took me home to introduce me to his daughter, but nothing, nothing ever came of it. And I'm sure you discovered that the Sephardic food was different oh, from yes. the Ashkenazi. Right, right. Yes, it was, it was a real wonderful experience. Very, very orthodox, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is I'm not used to having grown up in West Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, we were far from being ortho orthodox, mm -hmm. but it was a, a, an interesting, uh, different view of, of Jewish life that I never got. Before I forget it, you mentioned Maracaibo. Were you ever in, you were in Caracas also? Yeah. What did you think of Caracas? Oh, Caracas was a was a an elegant town. I mean. It was so, so modern. I remember riding up on the Teleferico. This is a cable car that rode up the mountainside in Caracas. And uh, it was a city that was so modern compared to the rest of the country. Where I worked in Maracaibo, it was an oil field. It was, it was people were down and dirty. I mean, it was a, 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 a Work, work job, and in Caracas, it was, a, it was a city of beautiful buildings and modern, everything was so modern. It was a dream, you know, people who lived anywhere else couldn't afford to live in Caracas. No, it was so expensive. But of course, that was Venezuela, and it was during the oil boom, so everything was high everywhere. But I, I loved Caracas. 
However, that was only on a weekend. I couldn't, I never stayed in Caracas more than just a visit. My whole life was in Maracaibo. How did the Venezuelans treat you? What? How, how did you find the Venezuelans? Were they friendly to you? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people all catered to the Americans. We were called Norte Americanos. And uh, they hired so many natives that, that we had the reputation of having all the money because we were the big employers. And so they treated us with so great respect and uh, we, we got along splendidly. Okay. Um, of all the people you met, your travels, different cultures, who are your role models in life? Did you have someone that you've really admired all of your life as a mentor or a role model? And uh, offhand, I really, I really don't have a. I was a stage struck kid, you know, and I I idolized people like. Paul Muni and John Garfield, Jewish actors who had made it on the stage and made it in the movies and were so honored by their peers in the movies that, and I always aspired to be on the stage, but I never, there was no money in, in the theater. I always took it as a sideline. I worked at a job, and then I my hobby was to be in a in a show in a play. So my ideal was to be somebody who had made it big in the movies, but I never did. I never followed through on that. I always got down to reality was where is the next meal going to come from, and it, it always had to be in the construction business and oil field construction mm -hmm. business. Okay. Herb, tell me about your family here in Dallas today. You have relatives here in Dallas, right? Very few. Okay, let's, let's uh, talk about your relatives here. My mother passed away at 96. My father lived till he was 70, 76. My brother and sister passed away only in 98 and 99. They were, my brother was 84 and my sister was 87. I'm now 90, so I'm the last living relative of my family. <coughs> my niece was my only, my sister's daughter was my only living relative. <coughs> and a, <coughs> a year or so ago, she had a stroke. And she's now unable to operate. She's in a, in a facility that being tube fed and she can't move, she's paralyzed on one Sorry. side. And that's my last close relative. I have some cousins who live here, <coughs> but they are dwindling. I have very few relatives left and I have no children. I have no, why my ex-wife is remarried. So I'm left pretty much alone in the whole world. Herb, is there anything you would want to add to this oral history interview? Anything I'd like to add? To add that I didn't cover with you or from your paper. Well, <coughs> let me get you some water. No, I'm okay. <coughs> I'm okay. No, offhand, I, I've had a, a fairly interesting life. I th always thought that I'd travel the world. But then when I think about my father coming from Russia to New York, he was supposed to be inducted into the Russian army, but he, the Russian army being as corrupt as it was, he was able to pay off a guard and he didn't have to go in. He went down to a Hamburg a port in Germany, got on a ship and sailed for America in about 1906 and escaped 
serving in the Russian army. My, his brother served two years and became a, a harness maker, but my father joined him in New York and, uh, and that's where the family got started. So when I think of what he did, he came to New York hardly knowing the English language. He was a tutor uh, in Europe and his adventures make mine look pretty tame compared to what I went through. I had companies sending me all over the world, but they paid for my passage, for my living allowance. They took care of me. Everything was handled. When he came from Europe, nothing was, he didn't know the, uh, he didn't have a profession. And he, he, he lost all his money trying to find a job and he had to take what he could find. He went to work as a, as a uh, uh, salesman, as a, went to work selling cigarettes in a store. His life was very hard compared to mine. I had it easy compared to his life. And that's about it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, extremely elated that I had the opportunity to do your oral history and what an interesting history that you have had with your travels, different cultures, different languages and what you have accomplished is, is remarkable. Thank and you. I, and again, I want to thank you and uh, I hope you have a good evening. Thank you.